that God has done, and we think about the hope that we have someday of how he's going to save us and bring us to heaven, and uh, then we sort of feel like we're left to live our lives on our own, and we, we, we think that the day-to-day stuff of life uh, we have to figure out until Jesus comes again. Uh, we sometimes forget how active and how much God cares about uh, the everyday pieces of our lives, how much he's interested in every aspect and every interaction that we have. Another uh, way that, another reason I think it's good to remind ourselves of these things is because we are in a church tradition that has historically spent a lot of time talking about the prevalence of sin. One of the core doctrines that people associate with our uh, Reformed Calvinist tradition is the idea of total depravity, the idea that everybody is sinful. And so we can sort of uh, internalize and live with this idea that um, because everybody is sinful, and I know that I am sinful, um, that when I sin against God or against somebody else, I can maybe sometimes just think, well, I'm only human. So of course I did. And then we just leave it like that. And, and this idea that everybody is sinful sort of becomes an excuse to not grow and change. It becomes a way to dismiss the, the hurt that we cause other people and the, the sins against God. And I think it keeps us from the growth that God offers through Jesus. And what I think Paul is doing in this passage at the end of Ephesians is sort of filling in some details about what Peter says in 2 Peter 1. In 2 Peter 1 it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And so what Peter is saying is that God has given us everything that we need to live godly lives right now. We can participate in the divine nature and the life of God today. The expectation for Peter and for Paul and the New Testament writers is not just that Jesus has saved us so that one day uh, we will get things right again, but that each day we get saved over and over again and we get transformed more and more into the image of God. We become mature and growing into a life of godliness where our lives look more and more like Jesus every day. And so part of the question is, as you get older, is that happening? As you get older, do you get more patient or less patient? Do you get more grumpy or more joyful? Do you have more love and compassion and grace for people who are different or make different mistakes? Or do you find yourself having more judgment and criticism of others? Do you encourage more or complain more? Do you have more friends and more people you care about or less friends that you share your life with? There's lots of ways that we can grow in our faith, and the New Testament writers expect that in the same way children grow up and mature, Christians will also grow and mature and become more Christ-like as we go. And so uh, what Paul is doing is saying, uh, if we are going to grow and be mature, God has given us everything we need to do that. Paul is saying, here are the tools and the equipment that you need to grow, and God provides them. Same way an army puts on armor for battle, and a football team puts on padding before the game. Paul says, uh, God has given you all of these things so that you can live the life God wants you to do. They're all available to us if we will put them on. And so we had the belt of truth helping us discern good from evil and kingdom's work from sinful works. We've taken up the breastplate of righteousness, knowing that our future and our reputation and our relationship with God does not depend on our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ, so we can stand firm and tall and strong for the battle. And today, we need some shoes. So let's read uh, this passage again, and we'll talk about the shoes that God gives us. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. All right, so God is going to give us some footwear. A uh, show of hands here. How many of you are wearing boots today? Anybody got boots on? A few of you have boots on. Good. Uh, how many of you are wearing, like, heels? Anybody wearing heels? Nobody's wearing heels. All right, anybody wearing, like... Um, Athletic shoes, a few more of those. Anybody wearing sandals? A bunch of people wearing sandals. How many, uh, any of you have church shoes, special church shoes you wear just to church? What, uh, what, what, are the, um, what are the qualities of good church shoes? They're, fancy. They're shiny, fancy. <laughs> they match your dad's. <laughs> what, what was that over there? They're uncomfortable. All right. So when we talk about footwear, and it's sort of strange to talk about coming to church because you can just about wear any sort of shoes you want to church. They don't really need to uh, perform a specific function. Most of us are um, choosing them because um, Matt chooses them because they're uncomfortable. I think more of you probably chose them because they are comfortable but, but we're choosing them because uh, they're, they're comfortable or they look good with the rest of the stuff we're going to wear. They're, they're just an accessory. But if you're going to uh, play a sport, what the function of the shoes is is pretty important. If you're going to work on a construction site or on a farm in a field or in a barn with animals, uh, you're going to want to pay attention to the footwear you're wearing. It's going to make a difference. It's going to need to, to do something specific. If you're playing football and you're a lineman and your job is to like push the other guy back and one of you has cleats on and the other one is in bare feet, uh, it might not matter if you are stronger and bigger and faster. You might just get pushed around anyway. And so in a lot of places, the footwear matters. Paul is talking about the footwear that God gives to believers. And uh, I read some commentaries and did some research about uh, footwear for armies in the ancient world. And, um, of course, it was pretty important um, because they did a lot of walking. All of the warfare happened on the ground. And so if you needed to go somewhere, you had to walk. And if your job requires a lot of walking and moving, uh, the shoes are going to be really important, more important than uh, someone like me who is reading and studying and visiting people all day. I can wear my church shoes every day. Uh, but the shoes the army wore had to, to provide some specific functions. First, they, were, uh, they had to have some cleats. They had to provide traction and stability because they encountered all kinds of different terrain. Things would get muddy. Uh, there was no uh, good concrete asphalt roads. The shoes had to provide some protection uh, because one of the ways that you would defend your city if an army was coming, they would like bury spikes uh, uh, on the top of the ground. Maybe they'd cover them in leaves and, and the army would come and then you would get stabbed in your foot and you probably wouldn't die, but it probably would slow your walking and your ability to fight. And so the shoes had to provide protection. And then uh, ideally they also had to be light. Because if you could walk quickly and your army could move quickly and you could get there fast, you had an advantage. You could get there before they were ready. And uh, this was one of the primary things that um, separated Alexander the Great's army from others was how quickly he was able to get his army 
to where he needed it to be. And so Paul says that one of the tools, one of the pieces of equipment that God gives us to stand against the devil is to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's kind of a mouthful. There's a lot there. Um, but it's one of those phrases that I've heard a lot of times. I've heard this verse a lot of times. Uh, but I always thought that the, the, the equipment that God gives was the gospel. But then I studied it some more this week, and that's not quite right. Uh, what is, in this text, what is the thing that God gives us? What's the like, subject of the thing? It's readiness. The, the, the thing that we have our feet fitted with is readiness, and the readiness comes from the gospel of peace. The readiness is uh, this Greek word, um, hetamasia, which is not a thing you need to know. Um, but sometimes these words don't line up right, and they're doing the best to um, put them in a way that we can understand them. Uh, but hetamasia means something like a preparation or nimbleness. It's a, a readiness to take on whatever comes. You're not easily surprised. You're quick on your feet. You're, you're ready for changes. You're ready for action. There's a lightness about your steps, so you're, you're willing and able and energetic. I was thinking about it like a spiritual agility. This is not uh, one of the spiritual qualities that we see um, in some of the other lists, like um, we know what love and we know what joy is. Uh, but this sort of uh, readiness, spiritual agility, uh, we don't see often, but it works well with this idea of shoes. Shoes that can be supportive and give traction, but, but be able to be light and quick and, and support you while you run. And so I've uh, put a little bit of a definition here. Spiritual readiness or agility is the ability to react and adjust and lean on the gospel to face whatever life and the devil throws at us. It's the ability to know whether things are going well or things are going badly, that God is there and that God is working and that God is still in control. It's the ability to be alert and aware to the dangers that are just as prevalent and real and just as deadly to our spiritual lives when we succeed and do well as when things are going badly. When things are, are going well, it's easy to forget about God. We can maybe be grateful at the beginning, but then they, they keep going, and suddenly we become prideful, and we say, look at all these things that I am doing. And there's a lot of danger there, that we forget the God that is providing those things, and it's just as dangerous as when things are going bad and we start to doubt the goodness of God. And so this is readiness is like, like buoyancy, the ability to be joyful and just and faithful in all situations, whether things are, are bad or things are good. Paul says the ability to do that, the ability to, to be the same and be joyful no matter what is going on comes from the gospel of peace. So the gospel does all sorts of things for us. We talked about the gospel uh, being our righteousness. We talked about how Jesus is the truth. Uh, but now Paul says the gospel of peace will give us this sort of readiness. And peace is a big part of what Jesus says he came to do. Right from the beginning of the gospels, the angels come to the shepherds and say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. In Colossians, Paul says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So he says that, that Jesus makes peace through his blood. It comes up several places in the Old Testament, or the New Testament, I'm sorry. The reason that we need the gospel of peace is because our default is that we are enemies of God. Our default 
to be angry with God. Our default is to work against the good things of God. Romans 5 talks about it this way. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through Jesus. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. And so we start out as enemies of God through our sin, and through Jesus, he makes peace between us and God. I don't think this is something we like to think about very much. We don't like to think of ourselves as enemies of God. Mostly we like to think we're, we're pretty good people doing the best that we can. I think it's a piece of that I'm only human sort of thing I mentioned a few minutes ago. I'm mostly good. I'm sure I've uh, accidentally screwed up once in a while, but, but, but I'm doing the best that I can. I wouldn't say I'm living as an enemy of God. But Paul says that's what we were. Scripture is pretty clear that without the Spirit working in us to reconcile us to God and help us see that we are both sinners and we are both um, enemies of God but are brought into peace with God, that we will continue to live in a state of hostility with God. We will doubt Him. We will question Him. We'll always be skeptical of what He is doing in our lives and in the world. And as long as we're living like that, then every situation that we face sort of becomes a referendum on the goodness of God. We look at everything that happens. If we're, if we're unsure that we are at peace with God, then, then everything that happens in our life is going to help us decide whether God is good or God is not good. And if things are going well, then God is good. And if things are not going the way that we want, then we're not so sure anymore. The better things are going, the better we believe. And so we're not really on God's side. We're sort of skeptical. We aren't working for God and with God. We have this sort of give and take. I'll be good as long as you are good. I'll do what you want as long as you do what I want. And it's like a, a contract. But there's still this, this enmity with God. We're not on the same side. We're not sure that we trust him. And as soon as he does something we aren't sure about. That love gets colder. And this is why Paul says we need a gospel of peace. If we know and understand what Jesus did, that while we were enemies of God and while we were working against God, while we were doing everything we could to resist God, it was then that Jesus went to the cross. He went willingly out of love, to make peace with us. He knew that the only way to end the hostility between us and God was to bear the weight and the pain and the sin of ourselves. He absorbed all of the anger, all of the hate, all of the mocking on the cross. And if what we see on the cross is God paying the greatest debt we have, even while we were still sinners and actively working against him and actively doubting him, it will change your relationship to him. If we understand how much he has done to make peace, then we will lose that skepticism. We will lose those doubts. It will soften your heart, and we will see him as a good God who is working for our good. Instead of questioning everything that happens, we can move to a place of trust and hope. And it doesn't necessarily mean you will know what God is doing. You still um, have a lot of questions, but you can get to a place where you can accept it and you can trust that he is there and he is working. I mentioned this in the Bible study the other night, but I um, heard a good example of this the other day. I found out just over a week ago that uh, one of my cousins died. Um, he was like 35 um, he had lived a really hard life. He battled a lot of mental demons. Uh, he was living on the streets, and he got, tragically, he got hit by a car. Um, and I talked to my wife uh, this week, or not my wife, I talked to my aunt for a few minutes this week, and 
she was talking about how difficult things were for Chad over the years and how often they had prayed uh, for him to accept the help that he needed. They had prayed that he would be able to overcome all of these demons and all of the things that kept him from accepting help. They prayed that he would be able to find some peace in a life that really never had any peace. And then she said, I never thought that it would end this way. But I have to believe that somehow this is the way that God answered my prayers. Somehow I have to believe that this is a way that he has brought peace for him. And she's, of course, hurting, and she doesn't understand right now. And She wasn't hiding from any of that, but she still had a trust and a belief that, that this wasn't God abandoning her or her son. But somehow this was how God was answering her prayer. If we have peace with God, we can have that kind of trust, ready for whatever comes. We can be gracious and thankful when good things come, and we can be trusting and hopeful when hard things come, because we know that we are at peace with God and He is on our side. And so if we understand that, that, that through the gospel we have peace with God, and that uh, while we were enemies with God, He died for us and made peace with us then we can also have peace not only with God, but we can live and make peace with others. We can live out the same gospel in our relationships. I think Romans 12 is a good companion piece to this as well. Paul writes, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And one of the gifts and the challenges of the Christian life And being a part of a church like this is what I mentioned earlier. We gather together on Sundays, knowing that as we gather, some people come here and they've had a difficult week. They've gotten news that they didn't want to hear. They've uh, been sick. Some have been caring for sick people and are exhausted and wore out. Some have been fighting with their partners or their children. Work has been tough. And they don't know what, what it means. Maybe the tears don't stop coming but they're here to worship because they're holding on to the love and trust of God. And they need a reminder of God's goodness. And then there's other people who come here to worship on a Sunday, and they had a good week. They have things to celebrate. They were able to start harvesting. Their kids won the big game. They got a new job. Maybe their their child is pregnant, and they're going to be a grandparent, and they want to sing and dance and celebrate. And I think a part of the the spiritual readiness that God provides, these these feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, is our ability to be agile and meet people exactly where they are. To see that person that's struggling and meet them with a hug and a kind word. And to meet those who are celebrating with an embrace and a smile or a high five or whatever it is. We can meet people right where they are. And give them exactly what they need, the way Jesus did it for us. Because if Jesus was God and if Jesus died for you, and Jesus is now on your side and calls you brother or sister and is working on your behalf in the world, we can help others see what he has done too. We can help others find the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And so we can learn to stop viewing other people in light of how they can help us or what they can do for us or what they have that I can use and take advantage of. And we start thinking about everybody we meet from a heavenly perspective. And we start wondering how we can bring the gospel of peace into their life. And so instead of thinking about how much somebody owes you, we start wondering what we have to give them. 
So what matters is not getting what you are owed. What matters is not being fair. What matters is peace and reconciliation and repair. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not, become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so when we know how Jesus treated his enemies, like you and me, he loved us and was willing to pay the ultimate price for us, then we can do the same. And I think this is a good description of this kind of readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That as far as it depends on us, we will work towards peace with the people that God puts in our lives. Sometimes when you're in a relationship with a difficult person, you think that you're responsible for the outcome. And I have to do everything to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. What matters is is whether or not that person changes and learns their lesson. But that's not what the gospel teaches us. What Jesus did was die for us. You can respond or not. You can receive that gift or not. You can receive the peace that he offers or not. But he did it first. And he paid the price trusting that in faith we will respond. And that is how we live at peace with others too. We move first. We love with with open hands and generosity, trusting that the God who loved us, even while we were his enemies, will provide the results. It gives us that ability to be agile, to love others with a gospel-shaped, sacrificial love. We don't have to use them. We don't need them to change, but we can love because we are ready. Our feet have been fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you that you provide peace in the midst of storms, that you provide calm in the rough waters, that you provide stability when our traction is not what we want it to be. We thank you that while we were still sinners, you died for us. We thank you that while we were enemies, you made peace so that we could be with you and be on your side. Give us wisdom so that we can love others with the love that you have shown to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Come to the well that never runs dry Drink of the water, come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy Come to the table, you will satisfy Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for This is one.